assalamu alaikum everyone thank you for tuning in to episode 12 of rising fintech i can't believe we've gotten so far uh we've uh, saved the best oh my god look at the size of that jug this is the man that What we are... have to deal with for the for the next hour uh he, he is not a normal mortal he is not going to drink out of a out, out of a cup it's going to be straight from the jug a uh, very primal how are you habib i'm good sir i'm good and i'm glad that uh, aside from uh, asking uh, financial services experts to come you also invite voice invite voices like ours who are from the outside looking in and i think that's very healthy right yeah absolutely i think it's very important that we uh, increase the pie when it comes to solving these problems in the financial sector um we need all hands on deck i think that uh, <laughs> i mean we the bankers have done an okay job so far uh, there's a few of them tuned in so uh, let's 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 calm down abhi let's let's relax <laughs> but but and i think it's time that that uh, other industries also step in other voices also step into this domain and 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 help us out uh, we have huge problems in this in this vector and uh, i think it's important that that we all help out uh, you know pakistan i think that pakistan needs to uh, get into the 21st century when it comes to financial services we're a little behind so that's a very important point you said now because as we go along in this discussion that is one of my pet peeves so we all root for the underdog right in this case it's probably the fintechs right um but i i do believe that when we talk about this right that we need to help people we need to help pakistan i think there's a genuine question that uh, our fintechs uh, are doing that and i think that's one of the things we need to talk about right because it's a it's something that is of starting to become of concern to me okay so i think we'll get into that uh Uh, let's let's uh, leave the fintechs for a little later i think one of the points that a lot of people have have tuned in for we we put it in the we put it in the description is uh, this very absolute statement uh, about why banks can't win so um, so what are your thoughts around that we what what so, why <laughs> is it yeah, go ahead so you understand that uh, uh, you know one of the things we do is growth hacking so that line was put there so the guys would show up so the job done uh, let's talk about something else no just kidding listen so just because banks cannot win also does not mean they're going to lose right and and you being an ex banker are are more than capable of understanding that so what we are looking at is a sort of a stasis is this a healthy stasis is it an unhealthy stasis uh, that, that is something to talk about so what did i mean when i say said that look so first of all uh, in case okay i'm going to take that as a yes in case you're on mute no no i'm not you kind of froze up a little bit yeah you're on mute you're fine now. So is it okay if I do a quick intro? Go ahead. Okay. So um so I I've worked with fintechs in five countries and we're going to add a sixth country next year uh, next week which will be UK inshallah. Uh we've raised close to 18 million USD in series A and series B funding working with these fintechs. Uh like all of you I'm learning constantly and I think one of my greatest learnings came when I worked with a fintech uh, they were all on paper. and we stayed them with them on their journey until they raised a series b on a 100 million dollar valuation and their prog- their entire uh, business model was built on working with banks so we got to see very closely with progressive banks in the gcc uh, in the uae in bahrain how these fintechs were working together what was working what wasn't working so you know i've been in the fin- in the trenches with fintechs in the gcc and so one of the reasons for coming here was to be able to share a bit of what i've learned so i'm not a very smart guy not like you at all or like brandon for that matter but but i do have some very good customers so we've learned a few things so that's one of the reasons i came on 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 board so one of those understandings and which led to that statement that you said is that at a fundamental level incumbents all incumbents and in this case banks they mostly cannot innovate 
right? Now, I'm very fond of banks. They play a critical role in the economy. In our case, I would say even a critical role in national security. They have a wide product portfolio. They have incredible reach. They have incredible trust, which matters hugely in a country like Pakistan, right? So, but it's important to understand that they cannot innovate, right? So that should have a fundamental and material effect on how they plan strategy and how fintechs plan strategy, right? So okay. um, <clears throat> what banks do is that they throw money at protecting the top line and the bottom line. And for them, that means automation and tech, right? So, and, and in, in many cases, this works. A good RPA robot will give you an ROI in three and a half months, right? But uh, this often gives uh, an illusion of progress and, and none of this will save you from true disruption if it comes, right? So, and the reason for this is that the fundamental thing uh, let's talk about why innovation fails, first of all, before we go there, yeah, right? I was, was going to ask you that. Why do you say okay. that banks cannot even innovate? Nobody can. No. Incumbents generally cannot innovate. Let's start with a few facts. What is the tenure of companies on S&P 500, right? They used to stay on the S&P 500 for 35 years. By 2026, that number is going to be 14 years, right? In the next 10 years, half of these companies will leave the top 500, right? In the last four years, a record amount has been spent on mergers and acquisitions. Uh, I think the number is $16 trillion, right? So what it tells me is that the strong are eating the weak, right? Achha, when you talk to the guys who are in charge of these large companies, the, so somebody talked to the global executives or billion dollar plus firms, and most of them agreed they need to transform to survive, right? Only 15% were very confident that they could in the next five to 10 years. Can you imagine? Only 15%. Wow. And these are not small companies. You know, we're talking yeah. about companies that have... <laughs> Sorry, that was my daughter. Companies have never had more data about our customers thanks to big data and analytics. You'll agree with this, right? Yeah. Look at banks. Banks have the most valuable data in the world. Spending habits, how people spend their money. They've never had more tools and resources. Do you know what's the number for... Uh, you know, if you look at the top 1,000 publicly listed companies... Their R&D spend is over $680 billion. It's not like they're not doing R&D, right? Mm. And they've got making products down to an exact science. You've got Six Sigma. You've got other concepts guiding innovation and design. You know exactly what to do. But what is the uh, rate of innovation? You talk to these global executives, 94%. 94% of them are saying we're unsatisfied with our innovation performance. These are the numbers, bro. Why are mm. they doing that? And I'll tell you why I think this happens, right? It, you understand better than most because you've been lived on both sides. That culture is a huge issue. So what ends up happening with banks is they end up throwing money. And so they end up spending money at protecting the top line, the bottom line, using automation and tech, right? But disruption does never starts with technology. Do fintechs have the same technology as banks? Yes. Do banks have more money to spend on technology? Yes. What is HBL's budget? Probably $80 million plus. UBL is not that far behind, right? So this is these are serious numbers, right? Right. So the point here is that disruption always starts with unhappy customers. It never starts right. with technology, right? And so because banks are so hardwired in doing things their way, right? And they're so hardwired in, in, in uh, how shall we put it? They're so hardwired in... Uh, in the way they attack challenges, right? That uh, they simply, when it comes to, if, you, if, if your question is, will banks be able to digitally disrupt themselves and become fully digital? Then my answer is no. They simply cannot do that, right? Um, and, so, if, and, and if I'm summarizing it correctly, I think the main issue you're saying is culture. Well, okay. yes, it's, it's culture. It's culture that does not allow them to innovate, right? So first we have to also say, what is that, right? So for me, innovation is very, it needs to be clear. We're talking about innovation here. And for me, innovation is defined as the creation of products and services that generate revenue and on a regular basis. Right? Right. So, so um, now, and so let me dive into this. So I've just kind of set mm. the 300,000 foot level here, right? On why banks can't win. Even but let's, let's go... Let, huh, you're right. So let's go a bit deep, uh, deeper into it. So why why do fintechs exist? Fundamentally, they want to steal market share from established players, which are banks, 
uh, or they want to partner with them uh, to make money, right? These are the mostly the two things. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so in the vast majority of the cases, Omar, these startups have the same technologies as I said, right? So, so technology is not really the disruption here. In mm -hmm. majority of the cases, customer behavior is driving disruption, right? So at first, so what? So what does that mean for banks? Now let's look at how banks and fintechs react to this uh, customer behavior that is just, uh, driving disruption, which will prove to me, uh, which will you know form the basis of why I think that it's hard for banks to innovate. So when when you have this scenario where customer behavior is driving disruption, you look find the activity where consumers are not fully satisfied. So that is the weak link in your customer value chain and that is your beachhead. So what is a value chain? Um, you classify all activities in financial services, right? And these are either value creating, value charging or value eroding, right? So you right. find the activity where consumers are not fully satisfied, right? So that is the weak link in the customer value chain. And in the financial services value chain, where our banks are hooked to the drug of retail and where there's a civil war going on in banks where SEVP level and below people get digital, but above that, they, the, the guys who call the shots do not get digital. In this civil war, it becomes even more important that that to find out this weak link in the customer value chain, right? So what fintechs do is that they make a beachhead here. They find where consumers are not fully satisfied and they take that bit out, right? So this is the opportunity for them to break away and steal customers. Mm. Now, now, if you offer something better, you will steal customers. If it's more seamless, if it takes less time, if it costs less. Yeah, yeah, na? So, Absolutely. So, so, so you reduce, uh, uh, so that's what you do. So the way to do that is using new business models or technologies, right? Or, or, or new business models that, that are enabled by technologies, right? Now you need two capabilities to do that. So we've gone from the 300,000 foot view to the 30,000 foot view. What are those two capabilities, right? You need agility and you need empathy. Right? Can you see my fingers? Agility, empathy. Right? So, what does that? What does agility mean for a bank? And that's where I need you to step in as a subject matter expert on banking. So, for a bank, agility means a modern, flexible API-oriented uh, technology stacks. Do Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I've got a work with from aggressive business I've got, I've got my kids coming. In. Go ahead. No problem. I'll manage. Um, so, for a bank, agility means modern flexible api oriented technology stacks right? right these are coupled with aggressive business development teams that quickly build partnerships and you know you've done that yourself and uh, and i remember you brought google on board well done there so and so and and they built it with a huge variety of companies right now tell me this description i've just done modern flexible api oriented technology stacks and aggressive business development teams quickly building partnerships with a huge variety of companies that are mapped on customer journeys. How many banks do you know that fit that description? Honestly. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. There's none around around in Pakistan. I think even generally uh, all over the world, it's not exactly, there. exactly. So, so but that was my. I have a counter to that though. Go on, go on. Yeah. So I think from 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 the from the point of view of the banks. I mean, if a, if you're talking to a CEO who's not really interested in digitizing himself or his, his organization, the answer is that I'm making a boatload of money. Why do I need to change what I've been doing for the past 30 years? Uh, okay, just so, because mm -hmm. you, you come in looking like Steve Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I got a comment on YouTube about that. So that's why I said it. <laughs> okay, um, so so that's that's a that's a valid point, and that explains why they do that, right? So we're right, right now our discussion is, okay, why cannot they innovate and why they can't ultimately win? Because sooner or later, your melting point as a sector is reached, right? Mm -hmm. For books, it was reached earlier. For banks, because of especially because of regulation, it's reached a bit later. For manufacturing, maybe even a bit more later. So so eventually, your melting point will be reached. And I have an entire banking scorecard on digital disruption, right? On, right. on if any of these applies to you and if you want i can just put it up right now and share it and go through those points but for now humor me and say that if i say you need agility and empathy and for me the description of agility is this you yourself have said that banks do not fit that description so that proves my point the other competency is empathy so you know how you have do you, you know how you judge if an organization is empathy they have emotionally engaged customers right would you say banks have that do they have emotionally engaged customers 
I mean, do 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 customers wake up, pump their fists, and say, "Yeah, man, I'm 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 a customer of this bank. I love it." Do they? Well, they're pumping their fists because they don't like the bank. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, all water went in their lockers, right? <laughs> yes. So, yes. So so so, so so if you ask me, what my argument on why banks can't win? It isn't saying that they can't, they will lose either. No, what I'm saying is that there's a reason they need fintechs, and the smart banks understand that they hack their own innovation by partnering with fintechs, right? So uh, so so. Do they have agility and empathy? I think though they are challenged there, so that's where my uh, statements came from. Now, okay. So, so that is why. What is the strategy left to them, right? So, what do fintechs do? Fintechs, as I told you, they attack a certain piece. Now, at this space, when I'm working with the mid-stage, mid mid-cycle fintechs, my uh, recommendation to them often is that you've unbundled one part. Right mm. now, you need to rebundle to re you've got a customer install base now. Rebundle to retain them, increase revenue and profitability. So your your original offering becomes the bottom part of the stack, and you offer more stacks on top. You look at your synergy, you look at your skill sets, you look at what the market gaps are, and you build that stack. Right. So banks on that that's the fintech strategy when they're at this stage. The bank's strategy is to keep partnering, right, with the fintechs. To kind of fight fire with fire and elude that, so you keep delighting customers using your partnerships with fintechs, and you mm -hmm. know everybody goes home happy. Can a bank do it on its own? And when it's very very hard, Umar. In fact, if you ask me, Habib, what is the one thing they need to do? Uh, that I will say they're on the right track. I will say that if a bank can get its DevOps and delivery teams. It can give them a growth mindset, right? And by growth mindset, I mean the classic Microsoft definition of a growth mindset that Satya Nadella says uh, enabled him to, you know, dramatically uh, make a pivot for Microsoft and make them, you know, a cloud player, right? So if they sure. can have a growth mindset, then they can deliver business requests in an agile manner, right? So my criteria for this, if you had to say, Habib, okay, so what's your criteria? I would say that, okay, a new a banking app should have new features every two weeks. So in those two weeks, you include research, you include synthesis, ideation, coding, uh, QA, and delivery. Okay, ji. Up when a bank is able to do that and not come out with a version two of its app in every eighteen months, I know they're on the right track. If you ask me, it's boring. Sorry, but digital transformation for banks goes down to the DevOps and delivery teams, right? And yeah. do they have a growth mindset and can they deliver business requests this quickly, right? So that's a good litmus test to see if they're on the right track. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm just telling you what I've learned by working with fintechs who work with banks. So sure. that's where that statement came from. I hope that's a bit clearer now. Uh, well, I hope so too. But yeah, definitely for me, um, I think you're. <laughs> you're... <laughs> so um, yeah, absolutely, you're right. And I think that 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 last uh, qualif qualifier that you put in is that can you can you release uh, features every two weeks uh, is is a great litmus test to figure out if your organization is actually agile um, rather than just having a few people who've done the certification so uh, nobody passes that test in this country unfortunately right and as I said I think the 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 major major mind block there is success. So they've been they've been successful in the past. They they foresee to be successful in the future, in this country because of what you know they make so much money out of lending to the government. That digital transformation is not something that is a priority. They pay lip service to it, but I can see why they don't want to do it. Uh, I can see why they're they're hesitant in going down that route because it's new. Um, anything new is risky. So I don't blame banks for 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 not being really, uh, you know, um, really interested in doing the digital transformation piece. What I do blame them on is the fact that they're providing really poor customer service. Um, you know, if they would just if they would just take a, a, a CSAT score, a real CSAT score of their of their customers, uh, they will find out some really harsh truths, and that's why most of them don't do it. <clears throat> so. So I mean, um, the answer to to better customer service or delight is maybe not digital transformation. Is maybe not digital at all. I mean, if you believe that uh, opening branches and having physical uh, stores really to provide services is the way to go, uh, more power to you. Go for it. 
but then make sure that those services that are being provided in those shops are 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 great because you mm -hmm. you are making a lot of money uh banks make huge profits in pakistan and they don't invest it on customer services customer support customer delight and that's what drives me up i don't care if you're if you're a digital uh, player uh, you know success has 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 kind of dulled that um uh, you know that drive and i see it i think success is a, is a problem uh, uh, in a lot of these incumbents but yeah. providing customer service there's no there's no excuse so uh, so i agree that there are times you can take a multi channel approach right but generally it's been proven that uh, digital helps you with exactly what you're referring to which is customer delight right and and yeah. so there are various in fact there are four models of customer delight in the experience age we don't have time to get into that and it's a bit of a segue but maybe one day we'll talk about that but i think it is important the the point that you mentioned that banks can't be bothered right so i'll um why don't i put this up i'm going let me know if you see this i'm going to show you my digital disruption scorecard for banks i okay uh this is, might be a good time to name drop so i just presented to the difc fintech hive yesterday and this was one of my slides where and they have uh, in their latest cohort there are 18 fintechs uh from all across the gcc um so one of, so this is my digital banking disruption scorecard right if We any of this applies it. is it coming no i don't think so you can go ahead okay. just just describe it yeah oh no no okay i just have to maybe i just have to choose the screen oh sorry You know, I'm new to Steam Yard. Oh, you have to you can double click. Doesn't work. You have to share. Poor UX. I wonder who chose this. Okay, can you see? Uh, now, yes. Now, wow, looks awesome. What great UX! Somebody who's a genius brought this into Sada. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Uh, so this is my digital banking disruption scorecard if any of this applies to banks then trouble i will simply say this trouble is closer than the thing let's quickly go through each one of these right because you say that they don't need to worry they're Ooh, making money nice. right that's nice that's nice the trouble is closer than you think yep it's like you know when you look right. in the rearview mirror and they say objects in the mirror may be closer than you think so this is <laughs> this is the they're mirror closer. right <laughs> they're closer than you think for sure so Interesting. first of okay, all no First of all, the first point is that banks are leaving customers unserved because of lower gross margins, and you know Absolutely. this, Umar, right? Right? If if the customer acquisition costs do not justify going for a poorer uh, uh, demographic, uh, then banks don't do this. And you say they make tons of money, but look at how many uh, people have active bank accounts, and you know that the story here is clear: the banks can't be bothered with poorer customers, right? now the problem here is if somebody figures out how to serve these customers with a lower cost of a customer acquisition but smartly using a combination of technology and process and and then they will only move up the value stack and address the core profit centers of the banks it's inevitable this is the innovators dilemma right this is not me this is clearton christensen so so if you are going to leave customers unserved soon or later somebody is going to figure out how to serve them and then move up the value chain and when he hits your customer base his cost of customer acquisition is cheaper right right and so all he needs then is marketing dollars and he can come to companies like us sorry for the plug and we'll growth hack the hell out of the incumbents right so that is something that is always and this is not just banks it's any industry right you leave any customer unserved you are going to get disrupted secondly right. and this is actually i find this point really interesting most people don't go here if your customers or your employees are mostly millennials gen z and digital natives in our case the tiktok generation right then you are open to disruption you simply don't understand where their journeys begin and where their journeys end how to hack into them at the right time you know most of the times if you want somebody to convert to a customer or to upsell or to cross sell you have to hit him at the right time i call that the third space i don't know if you've done uh, been to one of my talks on the third space but the point is if you understand their journeys you know when to hit them with the right content at the right time right and mm. uh, if you don't know your your customer you'll never be able to get that and so and it works both ways if your own employees and gen z uh, if your own most of your employees are millennials gen z or early late millennials gen z and digital natives you're going to have a trouble 
because their your level of employee engagement your level of your ability to have a good middle management is also dependent on this right so here's a great a great story to tell i was i was i'm under nda so i'm not going to take the company's name i was working with a company which is uh, uh, over a billion dollars in revenue right so i'm 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 sitting with the president and i say uh listen um i think you're going to get disrupted he's like listen i'm sitting on i don't know 600 million dollars of cash i've got a great leadership team i've got the board aligned to a three year strategy so what the hell are you talking about i said okay what are the two top universities in pakistan he's like uh, iba karachi and lums and i'm like okay so i mean people might dispute that but that's what he said i said okay good great so these are the figures i pulled from hr right this is the attrition rate of your internees in the first year from these two universities you know what that number was umar what 60% and these guys pay well okay right these guys pay really well and they're a very prestigious name so i said bro you will if 60% is the first year attrition rate from the best of the best you will not have a middle management worthy of leading such a uh, you know such a national company and of national importance right so it's similar with banks if they do not if figure out how to manage their own employees who are younger they will get disrupted because the best of the yeah. best will then go to fintechs like you're a great employee why aren't you in a bank yeah go on <laughs> you know what i mean though right cuz you've yeah, lived sure. this right so yeah, i yeah. i hope this point hit it's all it works on both sides of the divide your own employees yeah. or your customers if they're younger you won't understand their journeys you won't know how to engage them and you're going to be in trouble right because somebody else will come along who does that so the third point is also important if your revenue comes from knowledge based processes or is reliant on key knowledge based processes any business that is will get disrupted by startups in the case of banks fintechs if you look at trade finance umar and maybe this is more of a regional point and and might only apply to a few banks in pakistan if you look at trade finance it's often done by relationships to correspondent banking uh it's done through you middle um, medium sized businesses often don't get trade finance unless right. they have some relationships like you're from one community which is a business community and your business community has a bank uh then you have those relationships so it's often reliant on knowledge uh yeah. right and then uh, similarly that uh, knowledge could then in those countries because these are trade relationships right do you know what the gap for trade finance was in 2015 2016 1.5 trillion dollars that gap okay. of trade finance need that is not being met that's going to be 2.5 trillion dollars in 2025 right what's actually happening is that perfectly legitimate small and medium sized businesses are not getting trade finance right if right. some startup comes and figures out how to disrupt that there's 2.5 trillion dollars at play you just need to figure out kyc credit worthiness is get a co coalition of banks on order i know uh, uh, ibm has uh, invested in a company that's doing that i have a client in kuwait who is doing that and is about to launch uh, their their fintech so so this is just an example that if you have any uh, if uh, part of your revenue that is reliant on knowledge based processes sooner or later somebody is going to come in and and okay. get it done do you know uh, they measure the transaction a trade finance transaction from africa to europe and there were 5000 data entry fields that needed to be done it's cumbersome it's Daniel. flaky yeah. the uh, the errors are there us oh, it's and 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 so that's why you end up relying on relationships this and i worked with this group out of nigeria they're good people i know this guy let's just give him the money so uh, it's an interesting point but i think this is an angle that that also matters right okay and if your right. core offer is commoditized yeah so i i think that i think we'll have to move on i i i take your point we've picked on banks quite a bit so but i need to now mm. move on to the second point that you made which was again this is guidance not picking just guidance Yeah yeah that's your garden sorry sorry i think that back i but, told you i love that but i think yeah um <laughs> um strange way of showing it uh but uh what i'm saying is that let's let's uh, move on to the second point that you made was was that fintechs are not sincere to their customers these days or any more um uh, big statement what, yeah. what what's your thought process around that what are fintechs yeah. doing wrong no no i mean like hey, look this is still in a uh, work in process for me as well right? right so okay let me put it this way the fintech investment in 2018 2019 combined has been record breaking we're talking about 280 billion dollars right massive number right <laughs> 280 billion dollars right now if you 
look at fintech vcs right uh, uh, they are saying they now they're preaching the mantra that every company is a fintech company right have you heard this this is the latest thing you know there's yeah. this messianic vision of embedded finance right so to me that is dangerous right because if fintech is everywhere right then then who is looking at financial services and improving them exactly right and and so yeah. this what i worry is if fintech is everywhere it will be used to hack behaviors the way social media uses dopamine hits you know we love our twitter notifications the way they use that to hack user attention fintechs will then fight over getting the most activity out of users and locking them in so and companies like apple are already doing that what do you think uh, that apple card was right it had nothing to do with improving financial lives it was all about how can i keep these guys even more embedded into the ios ecosystem right so to me the mission of fintechs and maybe maybe i'm naive here right and to me the mission of fintech should be improving the financial health of users right now we are living in a world of where the embedded finance vision is coming in where we're going the opposite way right so another way of looking at it is that fintechs and banks are fighting over how to get and keep the most valuable customers banks are fighting with each other on on secondary accounts right ek aapka primary salary account ho gaya uh that's probably the how you ended up banking anyways and now you know the fight is on for secondary accounts right and usually what you do is you have really good deals and debit credit cards and then you try to steal that way that's one attack vector and so on but what is happening everybody is saying okay this is a group of valuable customers let me take them right and that is just something i fundamentally disagree with right so i do i think if you need to be sincere to fintech's original mission the mission should always be how to create the most valuable customers right so okay. why 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 do i why do i love this trade finance uh, guy because there are million imagine the economic activity generation if you create an entire stack of small and medium businesses who get trade finance who export who get into the global trading game you know you know your original vision of uh, globalization and capitalism coming to fruition you know imagine right. you creating valuable customers that weren't there before who are hampered by the current financial system 2.5 yeah. trillion at play look at it looking at something close to home there is uh, you know the jeffrey brothers i call them the jeffrey brothers but uh, the jaffrey brothers right really good kids so one of their startups i think it's brilliant what they are doing is they have said okay there are over 100 million uh, feature phones right so in pakistan right so we know that a smartphone immeasurably improves uh, a digital life and allows you to become financially included right and the effects are are so much the knock on effects you're able to protect yourself from poverty you get the right you know you understand this better than me so what they have said is that instead of trying to improve uh, penetration why don't we just improve smartphone penetration with fintech built in so right. they are going to offer phones on installments and they are going to get the lending partners to do that also so they are creating this ecosystem so what have they done now they are not fighting on valuable customers hey i'm going to take your customer they are going to create 80 million 100 million valuable customers themselves that for me is where fintech should shine that should be their mission right you you don't want to be if you want to look at it from a competency point of view you don't want to be the best in the world you don't want to be, okay in in your case ask yourself i'm sadape do i want to be the best in pakistan or do i want to be the best for pakistan for me a fintech job is to be the best for pakistan but every if you're going to have embedded finance everywhere if you're going to be yeah. just talking about and fighting over valuable customers then you're going to be the best in pakistan and you can do that by hiring the best by hiring the best cto by having the best go to market by doing your ux properly and all that but it does doesn't do it for me right so that's where this point came from i hope that was uh, that made sense No, no, absolutely, absolutely, it did make sense. Um, What do you think? And uh, yeah, I think that that everybody should uh, do their their part. I think just one of the one of the areas that the that Pakistan is struggling with is digitizing the uh, the uh, financial transactions in Pakistan, right? So even if you attack, if you, even if you get the payment vector right, not just the lending vector or let's say bottom of the pyramid. uh you bring them online or you you digitizing them or making their life easier uh even if our day to day life habib i mean our 90% of our life is in cash this is what i mean we're talking about the um 
0.1% of Pakistan. We're lucky enough to be in that in that number, right? And 80 to 90% of our life is in cash. And that is one of the main reasons that Pakistan is so far behind when it comes to a lot of things, um, you know. So I think that that uh, players in the payment space that are going after valuable customers like you and I, for example, profitable customers. But if we can digitize more of the use cases, I think that helps Pakistan. It is good for Pakistan. Exactly. Absolutely. No complaints so, from me. And 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 so the, that's where both the empathy and agility that we earlier talked about come into play, right? And so when I look at fintechs, I judge them on this, right? Okay. Do you have the empathy? Do you have the agility? And are you the best for the world or do you are going towards the best in the world? And I try to work with fintechs that are best uh, for the world, right? Because... I mean, if, in, if if they actually do care about me working with them, but I, I, I mean, anyway, right. that's, I thought it was an important point that needed to go out there, right? Sure. So Atiya, our good friend from Mastercard, he he's, he's put in this uh, this statistic. It's horrible. It really is, right? Um. So so I think that that uh, all fintechs, um, if they can really really get their cus their, their customer delighted and move uh, them onto their platform, whatever it is. Is it a payments platform? Is it a lending platform? Is it an insure tech platform? Uh, whatever, you know, uh, as long as, as you can move their day-to-day -day journey on, on that particular use case, um, you know, you're, you're doing God's work in my mind. Uh, it's very, very tough in Pakistan to scale uh, digital financial service. It's very difficult. And so I think that that moves us to, to our uh, next point which is the title of this uh, this uh, uh, show, uh, Habib. And this is why everybody showed up, my friend. What yeah. does the bank of the future look like in Pakistan? The so billion, billion dollar question that everybody is asking. Help us All out. Right. So, um, okay. I think, so, I think I'll rephrase this question. If you were building a bank, how would you do it? No, you know what you mentioned this this gentleman called Atiyah, right? And uh, he's a very, uh, very uh, he's is an inspiration in many ways, right? So one of the things Atiyah once told me was that the most successful bank in Pakistan of the future will be its greatest content creator, right? Right. And and that actually led me to the line where I you know, did some research, looked at uh, some of my own fintech customers in GCC, looked at what the banks were getting right. And that's where, you know, this concept started forming, where where I feel that uh, the bank of the future will be, you can call it uh, something, whatever, but I, I, for the sake of this discussion, let's call it the rise of the lifestyle bank, right? So ideally, right. it would be a lifestyle bank. So, But in order to do that, you can't fake it. This is a very important point, right? Because customers are smart. If you fake it, you will never get to where I'm, uh, we're trying to be. Uh, so banks need to say and genuinely believe that we are, we are all in this together, right? So our customers, they shouldn't be on a treadmill of life. They shouldn't be just going through the motions and banking should be a part of that, right? Their lives should be meaningful. So... How about I help them create moments? And how about I help them create meaningful moments and, and reach, help them make uh, reach meaningful milestones? That could be a, a, a banking loan uh, uh, for, for education. You know, it could, be, it could be a car loan or a house, so you can look at it that way. But I want to look at it in the ways of creating moments, uh, you know, where we can that are meaningful, right? So when you know how people spend their money, you understand what they value, right? And if you look at it in a meta level, uh, uh, you know, there's some incredible insights that come out from looking, throwing algorithms at these relationships. So at the first stage, a bank should use that to stick your customers. And this is the stage where I feel Pakistan is at, right? So let's say there are three stages, more like two stages, but okay, let's say there are three stages for now. So you, what you're trying to do, or all banks are trying to do, is they're saying, let's sticky our customers in our own apps by making them lifestyle apps and giving them convenience through it. So what does that mean? You build an ecosystem of partners and you give customers convenience when they use those partners. And these could be like movie tickets, food ordering, restaurant reservation. Then you give them the basic things like I can look at my balance, uh, I can pay bills, I can recharge my phone. Essentially, uh, the major, some major journeys in financial 
uh, ecosystem. And this is like the bare minimum right. that banks are trying to do, right? And this is the stage we're at. For me, the second stage will take off from there, right? Which is, it, this is where the bank will become your concierge. So it's a little bit beyond banking and the products of its partners. So for uh, you will look at the major journeys in the life of your customer and say, okay, you know what? I'm a bank, but more than that, I'm a partner that is trusted. And guess what? I have money. I also have reach and I also have customer trust. So why don't I own this journey, right? So what distinguishes this stage is a focus on owning this journey and giving unparalleled convenience. So you can call it the concierge stage. Uh, what journey should we talk about? Let's say, let's say schooling for kids, right? Uh, you have kids, right? So schooling for kids is a journey. It can involve school fees. It can involve logistics to you know, pick them up and, and take them and bring them back. It can help with admissions and so on. If a bank owns all of this and you know, you, let's say you have a two couple family, you're Harriet, you're raising two kids and a cat. You're, uh, it all gets a bit too much, but here's the bank. It's taken over this journey for you. It's helping you out. It's got the right partnership in place. It's so agile. And behind this is those two things we talked about. Agility, those open uh, API stacks, and those really aggressive business development teams who are like, okay, this is how things have changed in three months. This is the new sort of alliances we meet. Um, by the way, these guys will meet our governance metrics. They're out, right? Mm. So. Uh, so that is the second stage, which I think one can easily segue from for a couple of journeys, but I think there need to be a lot of journeys. But if you look at the ultimate stage uh, uh, the, of, of what I would say is the bank of the future should look like, I would say that's an agent bank. And that's not like a secret agent. An agent bank is a bank that is an agent of change in your life, right? So it's a bank that works with you to impact your life and enable your passion. And it's an agent of impact, right? So. It's an advisor above and beyond financial management. It is your first stop for a curated smart advice to 90% of your functional queries in life. And right. possibly to many existential and spiritual ones also. I mean, why not, right? So uh, now millennials and Gen Z have a really good crap meter. You will never get to this stage if you don't walk the talk as a bank. So you need to be sincere. You need to be very self-actualized. You need to be spending your money on, you know, sustainability. You need to be carbon neutral. You know, you need to do those things. You need to walk the talk, right? And right. it requires a bank that has defined impact as it applies to the digital age. And for me, that's not CSR programs. I have a, I'm a major, uh, I have a major problem with CSR programs, right? You know, uh, and banks have them, and big conglomerates have them. You know, hypothetically. So what you're saying is, I can make hypothetically, you can make money by screwing customers. And then whitewash your reputation with a good CSR program. Hey, we planted some trees. Hey, we sent these kids to college. Yeah, yeah. so that's how it's happening, right? My problem is you have an arrow going this way on your uh, capitalism. Then you have an arrow going this way on your CSR. So that's crap. And Gen Z and millennials will call you out on this, right? Twitter mm -hmm. will call you out on this. So over here uh, in, in, in an agent bank, business and impact are, 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 are arrows that are going in the same direction, right? So... That means you define impact as well-being. So that means well-being of your communities, your employees, and your customers. A bank's got to have a clear strategy for all three, right? And it needs to be able to uh, communicate that and defend it, right? Now, yeah. with, when you do that, your focus on well-being impact is your core mission of shareholder value. And it will never fail. It ne it's never fail. I mean, I can show you studies upon studies of how companies that do business be of that for, for whom business is beyond business, how, how their return on assets, how their profitability, how their engagement with customers is all at an all time. I remember emotionally engaged customers are up to eight times more profitable. This is how you get uh, get there. Let's think of an interesting example, right? Uh, that so um, let we uh, so loneliness, right? We're in the digital age, right? Believe it or not, loneliness, as you would know, because it's so hard for you to make friends. Loneliness is an epidemic in the digital age, right? So. <laughs> Um, uh, I know you guys are owned by an American, so let me give in, uh, uh, you know, for empathy's sake, let me give a quote from the, from the U.S., right? More than 70% of Americans are unhappy with their friendships, which is probably, when you look at bankers in Pakistan, probably 90% of bankers are unhappy with their friendships, right? So uh, if you look at the average American hasn't made a friend in five years. Now, are you telling me wow. that as a bank, with a massive network of people and data on all of them, even if because of state bank regulation, you have to anonymize it, uh, you know, you cannot help here. 
you know, there are places in New York over that you walk in and you leave with a new friend. Do you know that? That that's what those places are for. Hey, you need a friend, walk in, you leave with a new friend. So that is why they exist. So banks can own and enable these results by creating such spaces. You know, you can enable it through the app. You know, you have deals, don't you? A zinger for one ninety nine. Why can't you have a deal of uh, making a new friend or just take some information, share interests, uh, bingo, make it happen, right? You've got like yeah. what three hundred branches. Why can't you make stuff like this happen? You know, they're not on nine to five. How about you have a networking event six to eight? I know this is a. It sounds a bit out there, but what I'm trying to say is, if you put yeah, well-being, it's just the mindset. Part yeah, part of what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it's look. If I have a bank that cares about my mental well-being, right? I am going to be emotionally connected to it. I will also give it the benefit of doubt. That's another problem, major problem with banks. They're not open yet. Just if you admit your mistakes, your customers will love you more. Why can't they get the message? You drowned my locker. I'm sorry. Admit it. Say what happened. What went wrong? Who's punished? Say uh, how it will not happen again. What you've done. Get on with it. Right? Hiding it is like really ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I hope that's a sort of my so basically well-being at the core. Become an agent bank. Go deep into the journey. Start owning them. Right. So I think that's another interesting point. No, no, you're never too much, my friend. <laughs> okay. um, Atiyab has an interesting point here as well. Bank of the future needs to take in, in, inspiration from electricity or Wi-Fi. He actually had a previous comment where Wi-Fi was missing, so he's added that he realized that's that's more important than oxygen <laughs> these days. If it's not there, people miss it to the point of rioting. Wow, that uh, is that is not star, my friend. Uh, you know, people oh, come okay, out great, and riot. Great, great, the bank great. is down. A branch has a generator. Usually, a bank has Wi-Fi. You know, a bank can be a a a cafe for two hours a night for uh, for people who are qualified to enter uh, for whatever reason. You know, you know, there's so many things you can do. Banks are incredible. Listen, we don't we underestimate how the power banks have. I mean, it's not the money, it's not the num- profits, it's the trust mm. and the reach they have. You know, that mm. makes banks so critical to Pakistan. You know, we we don't have great literacy. Uh, but we trust these banks. We trust uh, UBL, HBL, MCB. These guys are everywhere. There's great trust when we hear those names. That trust can really be used. I trust my bank. I have HBL. I love HBL. Right? Uh, uh, can they improve certain things? Of course they can. But you know, I love them, and so I'm I'm going to give them the benefit of doubt. I'm going to do what needs to be done. But there's so much potential they have. So if, by the way, so when you keep saying that, I have a strange way of showing is. I think banks have incredible potential, and I just think they need to reach it for the good of the country because they are not just corporate entities in Pakistan. In Pakistan, banks really, really matter. You know, they really matter. They're a the part of the national fabric. Absolutely. No, I can I can feel that frustration coming from you. It's coming from a place of love, not hate. So that's uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. As far as as far as my mindset is concerned, when it comes to um, the bank of the future or the bank of the present. Um, I, I certainly cannot predict the future, but what I can say is that I think if banks can just uh, keep it simple and make customer delight, customer satisfaction. Let's forget delight. Delight is that delight is probably beyond uh, uh, you know their reach. But customer satisfaction as the north star, I think they would solve a lot of problems, a lot of questions that they have in their minds. Right? They get. I think banks are being bombarded. Their management is being bombarded with a lot of different messages. They're profitable. They're successful. They're, so they're saying, "Hey, hey, we're not hurting," but uh, we have people telling us that trouble is closer than you think. Okay, let me see what I can do. Once they open that door, uh, seventy-eight million vendors walk in and say, "This is this software or this hardware or my consultancy is going to solve all your problems." Right, mm. and I think mm. that confuses them, and that's why they're investing in the long, wrong things. I won't say the wrong things, the wrong way uh, of implementing those things. Right, so I think mm. that if they would just concentrate on the customer experience, they would they would arrive at the right answer for them. Because uh, you know, being being different, different, uh, uh, or or catering to different target markets, uh, our banks are doing differently. There are community banks. There are. Some some others which are uh, catering to some certain geographical areas, they have different types of customers. So you just need to listen and really, really internalize whatever your customer is telling you, and 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 just build around that. 
look, a case in point is the average salary of a call center officer that that is the front line of your customer Absolutely. support yep. is 25,000 rupees. It's 25,000 rupees. And to get more money, they have to work longer hour, hours or nights or on Eid holidays. If and this and is how, there's no love. If this, if the, exactly. If this is how banks think that they will be able to sustain the coming disruption, uh, they, they are in trouble. Now, fine, you could you could try and pretend that this disruption is not, not coming. Again, as I said, mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't predict the future. You may be right, but me and you uh, on this side of the field think that the disruption is coming. It's closer than, than they think. And so if you're paying 25,000 rupees to the call center officer, that is the first line of defense when it comes to defending your brand, delighting your customer, you are in big trouble. So this is a beautiful point, right? You, I think it's an you've really, uh, really honed it. It's a great example. You know where the first COVID nineteen cases were reported in banks? Where call center? They're all call centers. Mm -hmm. I mean that shows you how much they cared about them. You know, yeah. so so if you don't care about your front line of customer satisfaction, it's uh, it's going to be challenging. I think you you know you say uh, we're on two sides of the disruption. I like I said, there's a civil war going on in banks. A lot of bankers get it, but they're SEVP level and below, right? So they're fighting the good fight, but it's tough because you like you said, you're making so much money from retail. It's, it's you're hooked onto this drug, right? Um, and 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 they you can't blame them either. Those jobs are gone. My I'm, if I'm a bank president, my job is gone if that profitability goes. So I cannot blame him either, right? But I think in all of this, people are underestimating our state bank. You know, our state bank is a lot more progressive than people realize. Got a great governor, two or three circulars, Omar, and the game can change. And they're yeah. underestimating the resolve and the ambition of this state bank. They're and coming. I, Those circulars are coming, my friend. And I'm telling you, I'm telling yeah. you, they should not because uh, our state bank is waking up to its part in um, history, right? And yeah. I think it's bold. And and what it's already done has, you know, look on the payment side, look on the, the stuff they've done on the pause side. So uh, look at the foreign exchange things, you know, the ability to send money now out now. So Google and all that, you know, so they, the NOA state bank is saying, okay, you guys keep saying that we're getting in the way of innovation. Okay, tuck, tuck, tuck. Now show me innovation. And when it doesn't happen, State Bank will say, okay, so you guys were obviously full of crap. So yeah. here's a few more circulars. You guys can't do it. Let the fintechs take over. So I think they're underestimating that. And I think I think it's going to be fun to watch from the sidelines, right? Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a helpful conversation that you've said. But I'm going to flip this interview quickly because you said that they offered these plethora of vendors and they get confused, so they go to trade in their shell. So open banking was kind of supposed to add a sort of discipline governance and the right way of doing it, right? So I feel that the ban benefits of open banking that were promised haven't been met. And this is critical because I think uh, that agility that comes, that banks need comes from open banking. So you are the open banking expert. You tell me that the promises of open banking, first of all, for example, the there are three promises that Will customers will get more control uh, over their data and relationships with providers who are on the, related to the banks, right? Uh, do you think that's happening at the pace it should happen at? So, as you know, in my previous life, I was handling the uh, open banking initiative mm -hmm. uh, for a bank, and uh, I mean, we had very very high hopes uh, when it came to to uh, <laughs> you know getting the kind the right fintechs coming in and helping us out. We certainly needed the help. We were very humble about it. I think most banks are not. Uh, generally speaking, when uh, fin uh, fintechs approach banks, uh, they are they are told that, hey, I can do this easily without you. I don't need you. Uh, but we were humble. We were open and we said that we need your help. Please come and help us. I think that I two years, almost three years ago, I found our fintech ecosystem to be really immature at that time. They were not ready to, to come and partner with a regulated entity like banks. And so it was disappointing the kind of uh, the kind of services or the kind of uh, immature mindset that we that we ran into. I feel that has changed, but but there's a long way to go. I think the the so so when you mention State Bank, I mean we're we're Sadape is a product of State Bank's uh, vision. 
because the EMI license without the EMI license, a we wouldn't we wouldn't exist. Fair, fair. And B, and B, we certainly couldn't envision a future where we can be self-sustaining while providing. Uh, hopefully, once we launch, inshallah, we'll we'll, we'll see. The, the devil is in the details, so we'll find out. But a um, uh, great customer experience, right? Great, great customer experience costs money. However, the EMI license allows us to make money to sustain ourselves and provide this sort of experience to to our to our customers. And so um, now the the the, the kind of um, uh, the kind of environment has changed, uh, and I think that 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 hopefully there are fintechs out there that have matured that can partner with banks. I think banks have become more humble than they were three years ago. Um, mm. and, and hopefully this partnership can, can sustain. However, if there are uh, people listening and, and fintechs do approach me uh, for advice, uh, my advice to a B2B fintech is to uh, shut up shop and uh, do, go do something else. <laughs> a bit brutal. <laughs> It is brutal, but uh, it's it's uh, it's a jungle out there. Uh, having no leverage and then going and in, in sit and sitting with big banks and being completely dependent upon 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 them and their agendas uh, is 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 a recipe for disaster. And I've seen a lot of fintech company, so, companies crash and burn. So, so I, I have a best practice slide for that as well, but um, later. But I think see one one of the things is that. Uh, See, most banks will do only the bare minimum to facilitate easier access to competitive service for their customers. I mean, the reason for that is in this statement. I mean, uh, because, and frankly speaking, if fintechs were in their place, they would do the same. Yeah. Um, you don't want the delight and convenience part to be provided by somebody else. And just because you can't provide it is no reason to let somebody else provide it. So I, this, this is why I see banks dragging their heels sometimes uh, on and and they uh, opting for uh, you know and they will not and this also goes for data sharing, right? They would rather go one by one on their own terms rather than you know uh, go for some sort of a you know uh, a, a platform where it can be easily accessed by everybody to the good of everybody, which is why you know the this whole universal service layer is so critical, right? And uh, I hope we get there. Um, and another thing is that uh, you know. Open banking cannot change your behaviors, right? Uh, so uh, open banking, uh, you can build like some funky apps, right? Uh, but but if I download that app as a customer, don't actually change my financial behavior, then my value from open banking is not really delivered, right? So one of the key things that banks need to figure out who are investing so much money in open banking and, and, and digital transformation is that this whole connection from investing in technology to changing financial behavior, right? And working actually backwards from what's it gonna take to change financial behavior for the better, which will also result in profitability and upsell, cross-sell more customers for me, and then work backwards to open banking as opposed to saying that, okay, yeah, here's open banking. Uh, hey, now why isn't it working? Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think fair point, fair point. Um, I also... Okay, are we out of time? No, no, we're not. Go ahead. So another thing about open banking, I had to ask you, Arvind, now I have you, an open banking expert. This can also help me. So sorry for being so selfish. Is that the the, the promise of open banking was, Omar, that uh, we're going to have insane amounts of choices for every niche and nook and cranny that, that you know, our lives uh, enter. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I don't think that's going to happen. If you look at outside the world, the banking system looks pretty much the same as it always did. Yeah, you have a few fintechs, but it's consolidating into a few who have their own stacks, right? So if I'm going to apply what's happening outside to Pakistan, I will see no more than three or four or five fintechs that matter to Pakistanis. So then the question becomes, how can your fintech be that one? I don't think we will go to a future where there'll be lots and lots of cho uh, choices enabled by open banking. I mm -hmm. don't think that's going to happen. You know, I think it'll be a landscape more like the one that we're familiar with, which is like 
um, like I said before, that you will have your core offering. And once it takes off, you will build a stack off of it. And whoever manages the cash flow game and the investment game well uh, will eventually be playing the game for a long time. right? So this could be in micro investing. Uh, I hope one day it's in crypto. Uh, personal finance, lending, whatever, right? Um, but I will see, we will have no more than five, six fintechs. Do you think I'm right or do you think I'm wrong? Um, yeah, no, I think I think your 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 thought process is correct. Um, I think open banking is always going to remain a challenge in Pakistan. Um, uh, I think that right now, how I foresee open banking to, to work quickly for fintechs is that if banks are mandated to provide uh, access to the funds in the bank account and also uh, access to the bank statement so that you can credit score based on somebody's bank account uh, information. If banks are mandated by our regulator and and there, there, there is a thread within state bank that is currently working on this, once that happens, I think that that uh, that would help a lot. Uh, Isn't in, uh, in MPG supposed to enable that? Uh, yeah, MPG is a little different. I won't. I won't call it under the uh, open banking domain. It's more around the UPI uh, infrastructure. But, but it'll process. give you access to funds. You won't have to push to a wallet. Okay, go. Um, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I had my son here. Go ahead again. So I was saying, but it will allow you to directly pull from the bank account. You don't have to push and, you know, uh, yeah. top up a wallet. So, so, yeah, that helps, of course. That is kind of like open banking and you need that access. And secondly, as I said, I need, as a fintech, I need access to their bank statement for a year or two so that I can credit score them, right? And then once I can credit score based on what's happening in your HBL account, Habib, I can provide you a really, really good user experience when it comes to borrowing from me, which maybe banks can't replicate right so i think that that if and when that happens uh you will see the uh, ux around financial services improve a lot and improve quickly um and and as i said i believe there is a thread within state bank that is currently working on these two uh, these two things um when it comes to open banking uh, so we're waiting uh but it's the right time to get in the game so uh, my my point before was for B2B fintech. I I really uh, and so I I dis I, I, I discourage them um, to 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 go forward. However, I do uh, I do um, encourage B2C fintechs to come in and solve uh, you know directly consumer use cases um, that they can you know go for it. This is a great time to be. A I think if I, I think if B2C. A I think if a B2B fintech, uh, I mean, I know exactly where you're coming from because, you know, you know the reality is better than me inside a bank. But I think if a B2B fintech yeah. is sponsored right from the top and that guy at the top also has the mandate for digital disruption, then it can work. And uh, right. I, I'm, I'm hoping a bank can do that and set the standard for success so other banks right. will be forced to follow. So one can hope. Absolutely. Habib, thank you so much. Uh, we have one last really, really uh, important question uh, that's come in. <laughs> so so the fact of the matter, this is UX, right? I drink a lot of water, so I'm not going to have four glasses, so I put it all in one. And this is not a jug. This is actually a beer tumbler, right? And since I don't dare drink beer, this is my way of vicariously enjoying the motion, at least. <laughs> There you go. Asked and answered, Amira. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, Habib, always a pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your busy, very, very busy schedule, I know. Uh, appreciate it, brother. Thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in to episode 12 of Ryzen Fintech. We can't wait to see you again uh, on episode 13. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, Thank you for having me, and good luck, man. Take care. Thank you so much. Allah Hafiz. <laughs>